Lord, thank you for this privilege and opportunity. We are but broken vessels, and yet you have drawn us to you, and we pray that through the witness of Jesus that others may come to you, that they would see their own brokenness and their own need of Christ. And we just pray and ask for the presence of the Holy Spirit and your guidance and your direction. And we lift um, this message, this time, um, and everyone involved with it up in your care and your hands. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Welcome again to another Snapshot Testimony Extended interview, this time with Kezia Chisholm. I'm so glad that um, she has agreed to sit down and have a longer conversation. Had the blessing of interviewing her last evening for that, uh, that teaser, really, is basically uh, about 20 minutes. But we'd like to um, help you have a, a better understanding of what her life has been like and also through that, uh, it may be touching someone else who has felt that they're stuck somewhere, that they're not able to come to Christ, or that they're so um, bad of a sinner that, that Christ wouldn't even recognize them. Um, so it's my pleasure again to introduce to you Kezia, and uh, we pray that God will bless in this, this uh, testimony that she shares today. Oh, thank you for having me. Welcome. Yes, hello. So Kezia, the best place, again, for anybody starting and in, in sharing is from your childhood. Um, can you tell me what environment that you were born into? You know, were your parents uh, together? Um, just some background. Mm -hmm. uh, so my parents, um, they were married. Um, so I grew up in a two-parent household, uh, my mom being Filipino and then my dad being Guyanese. So automatically, I, I already knew that there was something different considering um, the outer appearance when it came to my mom um, being of a way more lighter complexion and my dad, he and I having similar complexions. Um, so there was that aspect where I was already struggling as to who to identify with. But um, how old were you at, at that point? Uh, so at that time when I was noticing that um, the earliest I could remember I was like, what, toddler age around that time? Because there was also differences in regards to my hair texture with mom. Um, my dad hair texture is a bit more kinkier. Uh, so there's, there was this dynamic where I was struggling to, to figure out who do I identify with, specifically because at that time in Brooklyn, um, in New York, there weren't a lot of interracial marriages or couples I would see. Um, and I always just felt like I wasn't black enough to, mm. in a sense, to claim, uh, you know, being um, West Indian or being, in a sense, um, claiming being Filipino because I didn't look Filipino. So there was this juggle in trying to figure out who I am. Um, and then on top of that, having my first sexual encounter. Right. Well, before we go there, tell me, what was it like growing up in, in Brooklyn? I mean, this is the city. Do you guys go out and, and play with other kids? Are you protected? Do you stay indoors mm -hmm. or? What did that look like? Yeah, so a lot of the time, because my mom, she really wanted me to have like my extracurricular activities um, because I did grow up as an only child. So I did have a lot of, you know, the music lessons, the piano, guitar lessons, having swimming lessons. So I was always busy in a sense. I did have my friends from school. Um, but even when I went to school, um, it was a predominantly black school. So for the most part, um, though at home it was a little bit different in regards to the filipino side at school i wouldn't even claim that um because there was a sense i felt embarrassed uh, okay so yeah and were you uh involved in your schooling was it a christian education or was no. it did you have a christian environment at home no not really so that's another thing too because i realized um because of the dynamics in regards to the religion, um, my mom, even though she did want me to go to a Christian school, my dad didn't want that. So there was a bit of a, a struggle, a strain as to where do we send our child. Um, but for the most part, I've always just always gone to a public school. Okay, wow. Mm -hmm. Your experience as a child, and this is in the 90s? Mm -hmm. Early 90s, okay. yeah. Do you come in contact with uh, 
uh, some, some kind of sexual impropriety from your dad or what happens that begins to wake you up um, from an, a, a level of intimacy or sexuality? Mm -hmm. uh, that was around the time um, when I was four. So this was around pre-K or kindergarten, I ended up having my first sexual encounter. So this was with another girl at school. Um, I remember her being a little bit older than me. It happened in the bathroom. And I didn't really think anything of it. I just thought that this was just a form of play. Um, and it wasn't that, you know, at home, sometimes parents do tell their children, if someone touches you inappropriately, if someone, you know, puts their hands on you in your private areas, you should say something. Mm -hmm. um, but I wasn't taught that. So I didn't think that with what happened, I should say anything. You know, that's really interesting because I don't, I don't, I don't know another time that I have shared or had an interview where I've shared this, but in second grade is when I began to, um, like go into the stall of the bathroom and, and play doctor with another boy. Mm. And I don't, and that, that actually, some of those things happened up in third and fourth grade. And I don't think anyone was aware that that was going on, but this is, this, is how interesting it is how the enemy gets us into um you know private times mm -hmm. that no one else is aware of and he's already doing the work on our lives that nobody would find out about mm -hmm. did that continue for a while or or what what happened after that it did so that well that particular um event happened once however there were other events that occurred by the time few years after that when i was in daycare um, we had our nap time. So during that nap time, uh, the girls would be with the girls, the guys with the guys. So, you know, they divided it by gender. Um, but we were supposed to be taking a nap, but this time it turned into kind of like a, a group uh, sexual activity where we were now beginning to touch each other inappropriately. So this is my second encounter um, sexually, and it was with girls. So now in my mind, mm. I'm just thinking when it comes to girls, you know, sex happens with girls, that right. this is okay. Um, and that just continued into cycles where I didn't realize that I couldn't stop anymore um, until years later. So you don't even recognize that, that sex isn't part of, of something that you would attain to later under the right circumstances. Mm -hmm. You just get all the wrong circumstances mm -hmm. shaping your life. Yeah, because even in that, I don't even remember when exactly porn came into the picture, but I know porn came in before my parents divorced. Uh, so that's even another level of sexuality that I didn't realize that um, I was already exposed to. Through your dad somehow or? I don't recall exactly, but mm -hmm. I know that it was through, we had like our, our family computer. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember my dad was still there. So this was before they divorced. Okay. Um, so I don't remember the exact way I was exposed to it the first time, but I know I was like in those, the chat rooms and just really just kind of sneaking to do it. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, your parents then do end up separating mm -hmm. and you start to grow up um, in a single mm -hmm. home environment. And w did you stay with your mom? Yeah, I did. So my dad had left. And so now I'm left with uh, the woman in who I did not look like. And so there was this frustration and battle and trying to figure out, okay, my dad has now left me, the person who I look like, and he's the guy who's supposed to, in a sense, protect me, but he breaks my heart. So now I'm left with my mom who, which is understandable, you know, years down the line, as I've had time to really um, evaluate things, was to see that it was hard for her. Um, becoming now a, a single mother mm -hmm. after being married for so long, um, you're trying to now, you're working longer hours, so you're barely home, and your daughter who is, you know, growing into a teenager, my, my, my friends, in a sense, there was a little bit of peer pressure and um, I definitely got into a lot of things to mask how I was feeling um, because I, was, I didn't have any healthy stress outlets. Mm -hmm. So for the most part, especially because God wasn't present at that time, um, I went into you know, doing a lot of things to just mask how I was feeling. So I was promiscuous, mm -hmm. um, just being active with both guys and girls, um, smoking just to really numb my thoughts, drinking because I didn't want to be present in the moment, just partying. Um, and just really struggling a lot with suicidal thoughts because I was just so angry. And yeah, I, I was going to ask, were, did you have a resentment towards your mom? I did both of them heavily. Oh, okay. Um, so the level of anger was to the point where I just wanted both of them dead uh -huh. um, because it was, I just felt so alone and I didn't really talk to anyone about it.
did that uh, somehow play out um, in like in your schooling? Were you always being reprimanded or anything like that? Funny enough, oddly, when I was um, actually moving here, I realized that I came across like some of my old report cards and it, it had said that my attitude improved. I was like, OK, so, you know, I know I knew that I had an attitude problem. I remember one of my teachers had told me, um, you know, Kezia, you need to go for counseling. <laughs> but I didn't want to because I just didn't really see see the need for it. Right. But my dad, he was really big on education. Okay. So when he was home, um, he was the one who would help me with my test. When I would get 100s, he would say, you know, you could do better. So for him, it was always, you know, reaching for the sky and just doing the best that you could. But once he left, um, academically, I just did poorly um, okay. because I just I no longer cared because if he was the one who helped me all the time and now he leaves, there was a sense of neglect where if he's leaving because in a sense I took it as he didn't care, then why do I continue to care about even education? Does sexuality keep playing into this uh, as some form of, of release from the stress and all that's going mm -hmm. on? Yep. So that definitely was big. Um, just just really just trying to numb my mind, not into trying to your be teens. present. Yep. Um, okay. Because especially with my dad, um, I wasn't really taught in a sense how to maneuver relationships, how to have healthy relationships, especially the, with uh, the opposite sex. What I was told was, you know, just wear a condom. So it was never, you know, Kezia, don't mm. have sex. You should wait just till marriage. It protect was protect yourself. Just protect yourself. Yeah. So I just figured, okay, that's fine. <laughs> so, Where yeah. does uh, the hint of Christianity come into the picture? Uh, so my grandparents, they were at their Adventists. Uh, so anytime they would visit us or I would visit them, I'd notice there was a tremendous difference as to how they operated. Just remembering, you know, when they would, you know, before they would go to bed, they would kneel down to pray together, um, singing hymns together. They would go to church. So there was this, this drastic difference from my parents where constantly I'm seeing arguing taking mm -hmm. place, um, foul language, you know, the disrespect taking place at home in comparison to my grandparents, especially my grandmother, just seeing how they communicated with one another um, a bit more on a softer, gentler term, uh, time, yeah, term, and um, just seeing that they would take time to pray with each other. So there was a knowledge of Christ. And even where I was living in Brooklyn, um, we lived a block away from a church, from an Adventist church. And, um, you know, sometimes churches, they'll have Bible workers that go door to door. And they did stop by our door. And long story short, they had asked if I wanted to get baptized. So this was like, I think um, my parents already divorced at this time. So this was around the age of 12 or 13. Mm -hmm. And so I did get baptized just to appease the Bible workers. Were your, were your grandparents around? Did they go, they didn't go to that church or anything? No, uh, they did when they were living with us just for a little bit. Okay. Um, but outside of that, uh, I think at that time they were living in Washington state. So are you just kind of going there by yourself? Uh, with mom. So sometimes we would go to church if we had time. Okay, so she developed an interest as well. Just a little bit. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just a little. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting what we do to find some kind of levity mm -hmm. uh, in all the chaos. And, and some will resort to a, a slight acquaintance with Christ, mm -hmm. which is really what he asks for. <laughs> because, you know, he'll, he'll do the rest of the work if we'll allow. Mm -hmm. But you have a sense then of like, wow, there's there's something different that I haven't totally engaged with. Mm -hmm. And you've seen through the uh, relationship with your grandparents that they seem to have a peace that was connected to this God they were serving. Mm -hmm. And yet you're, you're, you know, again, I've been sharing all week that it's so intriguing to me how God knows the heart that will surrender. And, and that heart may not surrender for many years into the future, mm -hmm. but God looks for ways to get like his business card in your hand. And so your your while the world is trying to engage you because the enemy never stops working mm -hmm. either. You're getting a sense of the peace and the sacredness of, of Christianity and Christ in this environment. And I take it then you do. Uh, you do get baptized. Mm -hmm. So I, I did get baptized. And especially because at that time, my, you know, my parents being divorced, um, my mom did want me to attend like Pathfinders. So she signed me up for Pathfinders. I'm just thinking this is just another activity because I was already involved in a lot of extracurricular activities. So with being a path, with being, you know, attending these, um, these, I think it was like weekly 
activities that we'd come together to like work on our booklets, learn more of God. Mm -hmm. um, I still didn't have any connection in a sense. Um, but what always stuck out to me was I remember one time during one of our like workshops, um, our director was just saying, you know, what do you do if you get lost in the woods? So all of us, it's like a bunch of like early teens yelling out all these wrong answers. Like, you know, you follow the North Star, you know, you draw a trail, you yell out SOS, like just yelling out something. And he was like, no, the first thing you do is pray. And so in my mind, that, that always just stuck out to me, yeah. um, even though I, I could care less about actually praying because my prayers at that time, prayers really were just, uh, Lord, just make sure I don't get pregnant or have any STDs. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't mm -hmm. in a sense to have a relationship with Christ. It was just more so, Lord, let me just do what I'm doing, uh, but at the same time, just protect me. Did any kind of sexual improprieties take place within the the Pathfinder in your uh, connecting with other girls or boys in that environment? Um, unfortunately, there were. So you know how Pathfinders are. There are it's a massive organization. Mm -hmm. There are so many church, so many clubs from various churches. So there were inappropriate activities that did take place um, at that time through like sleepovers or camping or camping. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this, this is one of the things I like to bring out in our presentations as likely you do today. Um, in that we need to be, you know, very guarding and protecting mm -hmm. of someone's youth because <clears throat> it is those, those moments and those incidences that occur <clears throat> that can bring about permanent damage to somebody's mm -hmm. life. And so, you know, I discourage, um, sleepovers and uh, on camporee trips and stuff that you have two people in the same tent that are, you know, likely to start investigating in areas of life that, you know, God doesn't mean for them to do. Um, so, yeah, I was just curious as mm -hmm. to whether that I know um, I was actually a willing victim. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it was it was something that I uh, didn't particularly guard against, but was almost in the element of, of inviting. And so I just want any Pathfinder, you know, leader today to to do all they can to protect somebody's, you know, morality as they go up, grow up, you know, in Christ. Mm -hmm. Just having to be wise, because I mean, at the same time with Camp Reeves, there definitely were a lot of highlights, uh, great moments, learning lessons. Um, but at the same time, wisdom has to be exercised in regards to who's coming and how the rooms or rather the tents, they're actually divided up. So, yeah. So you're getting older now in your, what, 15, 16, 17, mm -hmm. what's going on then? Same thing, continuing the cycle, didn't see anything wrong with it, just continuing. And it really wasn't until about my early 20s where um, I just wanted to smoke. So at that time, this is in a sense how I'm kind of, to, I'm coming to a, a atmosphere where I'm actually coming to a knowledge of Christ. And so even though all of my teens, that's what I knew my teens um, for, in my early 20s, it wasn't until after um, I had smoked, I just wanted to get high and just really numb my thoughts from mm. like some of the things that were taking place. And so the person who I had reached out to to get my marijuana from, um, he and I ended up becoming sexually active. And that wasn't the plan. The plan was, you know, just get the weed, smoke, leave. Yeah. Um, so with this happening now, um, us being so high, becoming sexually active, I was just so devastated and just really disappointed with myself because I was like, Kezia, you did it again. Another person on the list. What are you doing? And I was bothered. But at the same time, I wasn't really in my right mind because I was still high. And I knew the following day I had to go to work. Uh, so with me going to work, um, I didn't really sleep the night before. And and when I got to work, I knew that I wanted to take a nap because I was tired. And I also knew that no one was going to come into the pool at that time as I was a lifeguard. Uh, so I okay. took a nap and um, I was just crying myself to sleep. Um, but as I cried myself to sleep, I had a dream where I saw myself getting rebaptized. So I was just so broken. But just, but just to see how Jesus was, in a sense, meeting me in that dream, mm -hmm. um, it was a wake-up call to seeing, okay, I, I thought I couldn't have this relationship with him because he is someone who was just so holy. Um, but there was a song that came to mind, which is called God Is. So God is the joy and strength of my life. He removes all pain, misery, and strife. I want to go with him when he comes back. So that was a song that came to mind. I don't know how, but clearly that wasn't of me. Um, but just to see how 
despite what happened hours before, God was in a sense meeting me at my lowest point. Okay. And that would stick and in, tucked in your mind mm -hmm. um, and, and much needed to, to remember at another point. You're, from what I understand, you're, in, you're heavily immersed into pornography, uh, something that um, until recently we thought that was attributed basically to men, mm -hmm. um, that men are, are, we didn't see women as, uh, as sexually liberated, nor did we need to come to that particular point in time. But because of the influences of uh, the media and all the devices that we have today, the enemy has used those as a way to get everybody involved. And mm -hmm. so tell me a little bit about how your addiction um, formed. I don't know the exact way it formed, but it was already something I held on to. It was a habit of mine. Um, when I was feeling lonely, if I felt tired, if I was bored, if I was angry, stressed out, um, whatever it is, I would watch it. Sometimes that was reasons why I would, I would be, you know, late to certain um, events I knew I had to go to. So this was a habit of mine. And I didn't really think there was anything wrong with it because I thought everyone watched it wow. in a sense, even with like past partners. You know, sometimes there was this discussion of like, you know, what porn we were watching. So it really wasn't anything to to think that this was an issue until like years down the line where I realized that this is a problem. It was your normalcy, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or normalcy, I guess mm -hmm. is what I would say. You're working, uh, going to school, mm -hmm. uh, and there has to be a point in which, well, were you engaging with, with people more th um, as a result of the pornography? Sexually, yes. Mm -hmm. um, and there were times where, which was really crazy to show you how addicted I was, I would still be sexually active in, you know, during the day or whatever it was, but then by night I'm still watching porn. So I was never satisfied. Mm -hmm. There was always this desire to have more and more. And it just showed you that, you know, if you were satisfied, you would just stop in that sense. Mm -hmm. But um, it just really showed me how out of control I was. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't think it was possible to stop or be free from really. Right. Mm -hmm. You're involved with the church mm -hmm. still. At that time, eventually when I had that dream, that's when I began to take God more seriously. So when it came to like the drinking and the smoking, that did stop, but the sexuality, that was the hardest yeah. um, to stop because I didn't think it was possible to be free from. You engage in a, a, a mission trip. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanna hear that story. Yeah, so this, the way that happened, before I even went on that mission trip, because there were other trips I had gone on before, um, but at the same time, I was still struggling. But I, like I said, I didn't think it was a big issue because mm -hmm. I didn't think freedom was possible. Um, but prior to that trip occurring, um, I was in an unhealthy relationship. I knew it was toxic, uh, but I just, I was so broken when that relationship ended, um, I was suicidal. So it was another trigger where I felt abandoned from you know what happened years ago with dad. Dad left, I felt abandoned, triggered, I'm doing all these things, especially with being suicidal. Fast forward years down the line, um, a relationship comes to an end, I'm feeling abandoned. I'm thinking I thought we were gonna get married because there were plans for this to occur. Um, but at that time, I remember uh, when that chapter had ended, in a sense, that relationship came to an end. It was also, in a sense, a new chapter is now beginning. And with me being suicidal, um, I came across randomly. Um, it was a sermon, and I just remember specifically in that sermon, um, Doug Batchelor, he was just saying, you know, if you feel suicidal, just think about living your life one more year. And I thought, okay, one more year seems a bit more manageable because at that time I was working with um, a corporate, I was within a corporate company. And one of the things you, they always, they always uh, focus on is like, you know, what's your five-year plan? What's your 10-year plan? You know, what's your vision? Mm -hmm. Which is understandable. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, I was like five years, 10 years, I was like, I can't even make it today. Like I'm so broken. And how is it that I'm supposed to plan for the future when all I want is my partner? And so in the midst of that, I, I made an agreement with God where I said, Lord, um, just help me in this next following year, just this next year. Because if, my, if the next year doesn't get better, then I could just always kill myself. So that was my plan. Mm -hmm. The following year, Kezia, just focus on making some adjustments uh, because also the company I was working with, 
um, the model was, you know, we we are the best and we always are improving. Uh, so it was a it was interesting how God was working where the work, my work life was now kind of becoming parallel spiritually, where God is now um, becoming more of a motivation where those, you know, at work, there's this um, this desire to do better, to improve. And I figured, you know, spiritually, why don't you want to improve? Why don't you want to do better? Because especially going to church, sometimes you're just seeing um, people who, some people who seem to have such a lackluster life. There's no joy mm -hmm. with Christ. And so it was a, a push for me to say, you know, if you're going to be a Christian, why don't you actually have a life that you want to enjoy? And so the following year, one of the um, goals I had was to go on a mission trip. And within that year, a lot had happened where I relocated. I had moved to Florida. Um, I did have an opportunity to go on a mission trip. So within the first year, I did go on that mission trip, which then mm -hmm. transpired into the following year, two years later, of going on that mission trip. Uh, which so, was in Cuba, right? Yes, so yeah. in Cuba, which was uh, an amazing, amazing time. Yeah, it had just opened up to to receiving, letting mm -hmm. people come in from uh, from outside. Mm -hmm. And your uh, what was the main purpose of the mission trip? Was it uh, more of a humanitarian thing, or were you actually sharing Jesus in that? It was both, both. So okay. we took some time out, you know, giving out to the community, uh, but then also in the evenings we would have time to have service for mm -hmm. those two weeks. Mm -hmm. Seems to me you encountered some rather interesting people. I did. It's a lengthy story, um, but it wasn't until we would have our morning devotions together. And during the most morning devotions, um, Mike Carducci, he had mentioned how porn for him was his best friend, uh, that any time he felt lonely, tired, or bored, he would turn to it. And in my mind, I'm just sitting there, the sun is shining, and I'm just in dis like just confused because I'm just like, wait, that's what porn is for me. Porn is my best friend. And I generally didn't think that anybody else looked at porn like that until I actually audibly heard that. And that really began the catalyst of where I was like, okay, God was now really tugging at my heart and showing me that, you know, you can be free, uh, but at the same time, I wasn't excited to let go. And by the following day, um, that's where I had two different encounters with people being demon possessed. And it wasn't until like the second encounter with that person where I had asked the person if they had wanted prayer uh, because I knew that they looked distraught, that this, something was totally off. And when I had prayed with them, I had asked them, you know, um, or not asked them, but I began to pray. Mm -hmm. uh, so with having the translator there, uh, I'm speaking English, translator, translate in Spanish. And I just remembered, you know, as I'm closing my eyes, the lady, uh, she did not close her eyes. She just had her eyes on me. And I just remembered, you know, thinking, God, you know, bring back verses that talk about casting out demons. But at that same time, God is telling me, you know, how are you trying to cast out demons when you yourself love your demons? And I knew that demons had the, the ability to interchange with one another. And, and my mind was just kind of really flustered and trying to focus, trying to pray. But at the same time, I'm like, Kezia, what are you doing when you know you love your porn? You love your masturbation. You love your sexual partners. Like, you don't want to let it go. And it's for, a pacifier. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. It was. And uh, by the following day, um, having the opportunity to share on the sanctuary message um, with my background being within construction management and now going from a master's in architecture, just to see how God was speaking to me and just showing me um, when it came to the system of the sanctuary, how God was really intentional with what he designed. Mm. Um, it was showing me that God loved me dearly, that he wanted to restore his image back to me. Amen. Uh, but it was a moment where to see how my work life, the things I was encountering day by day at work, how, you know, when you think about someone like owners having exposures with building owners, we have architects, you have uh, different people that work on um, a specific building. Um, if a person has money, they will build you a building. And for me, I'm just like, no one has built me a building. But to see how God, the master architect, in a sense, has created a system, a, a structure for us to follow, um, it became more intimate and more real where I was like, wow, God, like you really love me that much that you're providing a practical way for me to be, be restored back to your image. And just having that in mind, even though those events had transpired, um, I still wasn't you know, excited to let go of my habits. 
But by the following day, Friday, um, that was my last day there. And because we came together to have our devotions, I had opened up to the group and just said, you know, I love this trip. I had such an amazing time, but I actually am struggling with porn and mm. masturbation. And I remembered being so vulnerable, but scared. Um, but immediately as I had shared that, um, a few people had came up to hug me as mm. I was like crying because mm. I, I knew that it was a struggle. I didn't know how my journey of freedom will look, but I was willing to start. And this was a, I mean, this is just as bad as somebody who was addicted to drugs or alcohol. This had become part of your life. Mm -hmm. It was truly ingrained in you. So the idea of giving it up was probably seemed like an impossibility to mm -hmm. you. Impossible. It was scary because now it's like, what does my life look like without it? Yeah. But even though, you know, we, I had these events transpire, I go back to Florida and it so happened to be that Mike had to come to Central Florida as well. So we still kept oh, in contact. I don't think it just so happened. <laughs> no, there I know, I know. are no coincidences. Yeah. God yeah. was really working it out because God knew I needed a follow up. Yeah, um, praise Lord. And so, you know, with the timing to see how I was living in Central Florida at that time, Mike had to come to Central Florida as well. And I remember he and I, you know, he wanted, we were going to connect. So this is just a week after the trip. <laughs> and um, for me, the, the time, the schedule, it was gonna be like on a Tuesday we would meet. But for me in my head, I was like, this is my only day off from work. It was Independence Day. And I had weave in my hair. I need to take out my twist. Mm -hmm. And so in my mind, I'm like, okay, do I meet with Mike? Do we talk or do I do my hair? And in my mind, I was like, I really don't want to talk about the porn right mm -hmm. now because I don't, I'm not ready to let go of it. And so I told Mike, I said, Mike, you know, I know we're supposed to meet up, but I need to do my hair. I need to take my weave out. <laughs> and he's like, oh, Kizzy, don't worry about it. I'll help you. Yep. And in my mind, I'm like, wait, what? How are you going to do that? Yeah, because in my mind, I'm like, who's this white guy with my hair texture? I don't know how right. this is going to work mm -hmm. out. But I said, okay. Uh, so we met and um, he was helping me to take out my hair. And of course, as we're talking. Because Mike is a, a hairdresser. Yes. Yeah. So when he had, you know, when we're talking, I realized I'm like, OK, this is why he just was so excited to yeah. help me. But as we were, you know, we were taking my hair out. Um, it was amazing to see how spiritually it was also a moment where God was unpacking or unraveling in the sense the things from the past where physically speaking, you know, my hair was now being taken out. But then there was a, there was this unraveling from the past where, you know, Mike and I we were talking, we were talking about the porn, the things that had occurred in the past. But even with that, I was still defensive because now we're talking about my darling sin. Yeah. You're, now you're going to be protective. Yeah, yeah, I was protective. I mean, he was bringing out the facts and things I was somewhat aware of. But at the same time, one of my issues I realized was for me to give up what I love for someone that I cannot see or touch or hold my five senses can't quite connect with mm -hmm. God like that. Mm -hmm. It was a struggle. Because you think about a sex addict, you know, that's one of the reasons why they continue to be with someone. There's that level of companionship. Mm -hmm. Even though it may be false, even though it's a counterfeit, there's this ability to still connect, even though if it's temporary and if it's dangerous. So that's where, like, you know, God's permitting all these events to occur. Um, but I was still struggling to just say, like, okay, I'm going to, you know, really give in. <laughs> Wow. So through the uh, discussion with Mike, I, I would imagine that you arrive at a point of, of some level of accountability. Mm -hmm. So there were several things that Mike had mentioned, uh, one of them being like, you know, getting a filter on my device, mm -hmm. um, Covenant Eyes. Mm -hmm. Even though he had told me about that, it wasn't until like a few months later that I was like, OK, I actually do need it because, you know, you know, someone's addicted when they can't stop. Like they're telling like you, you're finding out these facts in regards to like, you know, sex trafficking, porn is connected to sex trafficking. Uh, the people that you watch, they're still human beings. They're still a child of God, despite yeah, their choice. Yeah, somebody's son and daughter. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And even though I was aware of these things, I still couldn't stop. Like I, I was going through withdrawals. I was still relapsing. And it wasn't until some events that occurred later on um, within the year that I, it made sense as to why I was relapsing. So the biggest thing really was to get that filter on um, the software filter um, on my, all my devices um, mm -hmm. that has made such a difference because now 
there was a report that was being sent out weekly to an accountability partner. Mm -hmm. So to one of my close friends. Um, and it's limiting your accessibility. Yes. And it made me really think, like, do we want my friend <laughs> to get my reports? Right. Like, this is embarrassing. I don't want to talk about it. But yeah, so just having that accountability. Which means that also now God has an inroad for you to begin to develop other types of connections and conversations and uh being filled more with his desires and his plans for you mm -hmm. it, he's patient he's loving he's so kind and you know he doesn't yank something out of our hands it has to be our decision uh, you know along the way mm -hmm. you begin to develop a, a rapport with coming out ministries and and you begin to grow into uh, uh being coming an associate with coming out ministries mm -hmm. Tell me the backstory on that. Yes, yeah, so I was inquired um, if I was available and interested in um, becoming an associate speaker. And even when I was asked, I was just like, wait, what? <laughs> Why? <laughs> because for me, my biggest goal, it really was just Kezia, be free. Be mm -hmm. free, have the victory and walk in the victory. And the thought of having to help people, I mean, that those are thoughts in your mind, you know, like one person at a time, you know, just keeping it small, um, because in a sense, my story and, and what I, the things I think about and just knowing all the details, um, there is that sense of shame and embarrassment. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, everything has already happened. It's in the past, um, but God has a way of working things out for my good, but also to aid in other people. Yeah. Um, so even when I think about like Luke 22, 32, where it talks about Jesus says that, you know, he's prayed for us and that, you know, that our faith would fail not. And that when we are converted, that we would strengthen our brethren. Mm -hmm. So there was that reminder of God just saying, you know, yes, you know, this has happened in the past, um, but I have an, a way of turning evil for good. Amen. And so it's been such an amazing journey because God knows I definitely did not have this in store, um, especially when I had mentioned in regards to the relationship that came to an end um, when it came to like that five year plan. You know, I'm way past that five year mark, but to see how what has transpired, I'm still mind blown um, by what God has permitted me to to journey through and just to really be able to see him as a father. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. You know, I'm moved by what you're telling me because this in, in my eyes is a practical application of Revelation 12, 11 mm -hmm. that says that we overcome the enemy by the word of our testimony and by the blood of the lamb. So as you share your testimony with others today, you help uh, with the power of Jesus to help people see that victory is possible yes. through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. um, you've moved on with your life or you're moving on with your life today. And uh, instead of the being dragged down by the addictions, you're actually you know, celebrating the power of the freedom that Jesus Christ gives you uh, continuing in your education, um, de developing as an architect and still sharing Jesus uh, wherever you go. And now he has you in a, uh, a mission field here uh, at Andrews University. And um, from what I know, that there are many people who suffer on the university from same-sex attraction and, and also sexual addiction I can't wait to hear the stories of how God will put you in touch with the people that desire to break free. Um, you know, God is never forceful, always mm -hmm. invitational, mm -hmm. and you can be a beacon of light to anyone who is wanting to experience freedom in Jesus Christ. So I want to thank you so much uh, because you are very vulnerable and very transparent. And I know that that's not always easy, but I've shared that if I could be that addicted and that open in my sin, then why shouldn't I be that open and that transparent when it comes to uh, reflecting the love, the light, and the redemption and restoration that Jesus Christ offers? Good point. And yep. so thank you, thank you so very, very much. Thank you. Thank you.